Welcome to the second week of summer school. And for those of you who've come for the first time this week, I hope you have as wonderful a time as I've heard the rest have had. It's today my great pleasure to introduce what I suppose I can call an old friend, Chris Danziger. Many of you will have heard him. Many of you will know that his lecture theatres are always packed and that he is excellent. And after a break of about two years now, we've got three, we've got Chris Danziger back. He's given me a very modest CV and doesn't want to, want to add to it. So I'm going to tell you the little bit that we have. Um, Christopher Danziger was a student and a lecturer on UCT staff. He then went to England and for the last 17 years he's been a tutor in the Continuing Education Department of Oxford University. His special interests are the history of Napoleonic France and Roman of Russia, on both of which he has previously lectured at summer school. He has also written a few books on South African and European historical, or history, not historical, history. Please welcome Chris Danziger. Okay, can everyone hear me? Thank you, Medi, for that introduction. She, she said, a modest introduction reminds me of the famous quip that Churchill made when Attlee was pointed out to him as a very modest man. Do you remember that? He said, he's got plenty to be modest about. <laughs> um, just, just a few uh, sort of housekeeping notices. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very fond of the UCT summer school audiences, except there's a slight tendency not to be parted from your mobile phones. So if everyone could please switch them off now, I'd be very grateful. You should all have a handout, which they processed with amazing speed and efficiency when I came in this morning. And this handout is a chronology on one side uh, of the period that we're covering. And on the other side, there are some names and places uh, which you may find difficult to pick up when I mention them in the course of the lecture. So they're really just helpful references. Uh, I've already been asked a couple of times about um, whether can we close the door around? Thank you very much. About uh, whether I will be producing the little booklet of notes that I usually produce, and the answer to that is yes. And the reason that people ask me, I gather, is because then it means they don't have to bother to take notes while I'm speaking, which is good. Um, and uh, they'll certainly be here on Wednesday, those little notebooks, um, could even be before then. Okay, well, um, I'm going to... Uh... Hang on, why am I... I think I'm going the wrong way now. <laughs> I need to get to the beginning. That's it. Thank you very much. OK. Right. Well, uh, what I would have liked to have done is to take you totally by surprise with seven absolutely unrelated images. Um, and of course, uh, it won't take you quite by surprise because we're all here on a course about the Crimea, so you might guess the connection. But uh, here is a piece of gold and jewelry um, made by a Scythian goldsmith in approximately 700 BC. And like a lot of the other things we're going to talk about today, and that goes right up to 2017, incidentally, um, we, are, uh, we don't know that much about the Scythians, 
but anthropologists describe them as a sub-Iranian speaking people. And here are the remains of a Greek settlement uh, at Kersoniso, sometimes pronounced, and in the background are the remains of domestic houses and shops, and in the foreground are the pillars of a Greek temple. And many of you will have seen uh, settlements like this. They're not uncommon throughout the Mediterranean world. <coughs> And here are some tombs cut into a hillside. And the structure and design of these tombs reveal that they belong to people called the Ostrogoths. And uh, the Ostrogoths were part of the great migration of Gothic tribes from Northern Europe in the fourth century AD. And uh, once again, uh, we don't know an awful lot about them, but we will talk more about them later. And here is a fort built by the Genoese from Genoa, of course, in Western Italy. And the Genoese built dozens of forts like this all over the southern Mediterranean. Once again, many of you may have seen them. And they built them to protect the trading interests on which their republic relied. <coughs> and here is an Arabian Knights-style palace uh, a bit like a smaller version of the Alhambra in Spain, and it's unmistakably Asiatic and Muslim in its style and techniques. And here is a Christian church in the Russian Orthodox tradition, as you can see from its lavish golden domes and its separate bell tower. And Russian Orthodox churches usually conform to a standard set of architectural features and there are churches like this all over Russia, but particularly, of course, in Moscow, which was once known as the city of a thousand churches. And here is a snowy scene of a villa in the classic Italian Renaissance style, which was perfected in central Italy in the 15th century. And the classic style prides itself on its plainness and the intention is to harmonize with the setting and the grand interiors which lie inside come as something of a surprise. And here is the same palace in midsummer. So, Iran, Greece, the Goths, Genoa, the Alhambra, Moscow, Florence. We begin, it would have, you know, we begin with a very widely spread net and it would have been Nice to have been able to take you by surprise, but of course you'll know why I've started with these things, because all the images which I've shown you were taken within a radius of 50 miles on the tip, the southern tip of the Crimean Peninsula. And we'll come back to most of these images again. And I can't think of anywhere in the world, certainly nowhere that I've been to, which has been home to more waves of human traffic than the Crimea. So let's start by taking stock of the Crimean Peninsula itself. It covers about 27,000 square kilometers, or if you're as old as I am, just over 10,000 square miles. It's slightly smaller than Lesotho. The population is slightly smaller than Lesotho. And I'm very impressed by your intellectual curiosity in being prepared to devote five hours of your time to an exploration of somewhere with a smaller land surface area and population as Lesotho. It's the same size as Burundi or the island of Haiti. If it were an American state, it would be the eighth smallest state, just ahead of Maryland. So how much diversity can you squeeze into a place like that, but even that's slightly exaggerating it, because almost all the features of interest are on this southern shore. Um, in other words, the bottom fifth of this, of the map as, as you see it. Its latitude is 44 degrees north. That's the same as Montreal in Canada, or Lyon in France, or Minneapolis in the United States. And uh, here you see it in its European context. 
If it were 44 degrees south, if you understand me, it would be 700 miles south of Cape Town. So this is not a tropical or even a semi-tropical or subtropical area. This is a place that's distinctly northern in every respect. And uh, it sounds as if it should be cold and inhospitable. And of course, for a few months of the year, it is just that. And it would be much more so if it were not for the ridge of mountains that run east to west across its center, which shield the southern half of the peninsula from the worst of the northerly winds. So we're talking about a place that's very small and definitely northerly. But the fate of the Crimea was to straddle one of the great crossroads of history, where the east meets the west, where Islam met Christianity, where the maritime world met the steppe, and where empire met nationalism. And the result is one of the most complex and multi-layered societies and places in the world. However, I'm not going to pretend that the Crimea is one of those small places like Greece or Israel whose imprint has changed the history of the world. It's the other way around, really. It's hard to think of anywhere on which the world has left a bigger imprint. And that's the story that we'll be following for the next five days. And small as it is, the story of the Crimea takes in Genghis Khan, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, Pushkin, Chekhov, Stalin, Churchill, Roosevelt, Putin, and uh, especially in its later stages, many of the people we will discuss will be well known to you. But in its earlier stages, which is what we're going to start with, uh, what we know of the people of the Crimea is derived partly from archaeology and partly from the only literate community in the area, who were, of course, the Greeks. And in Homer's Odyssey, written in the 8th century BC, we're told that people called the Cimmerians lived beyond the Oceanos, in a land of fog and darkness, at the edge of the world and the entrance to Hades. And of course, Homer, whoever he was, or whether he ever existed at all, was a poet, not a historian. Herodotus, on the other hand, writing in the fifth century BC, was a historian. And because he more or less pioneered the systematic study of history, is often referred to as the father of history. And in addition, in a, instead of relying on semi-fictitious accounts, he actually visited the Crimea himself. Not a major journey for someone who came from Bodrum in southwestern Turkey. However, not everybody believes everything Herodotus said. And Voltaire said it would be more appropriate to call him the father of lies. Um, and that's the case with almost all the people we're going to quote uh, for the next four days. So, for what it's worth, Herodotus agreed with Homer that the Crimea had been inhabited by Sumerians, and they were the first of a series of what anthropologists call Indo-European-speaking Indo people who migrated southwards and westwards across the western, across the European steppes. And uh, Indo-European people, incidentally, I'm sure you know this, but they're people whose languages have enough common features to suggest that they all once came from the same ethnic stock. Um, sometimes when you look at these languages, they look totally different from each other, but that's because you know, for instance, uh, the word snow I discovered the other day, which snew, of course, in German or Afrikaans or Dutch, and neige in, fr in French sound very different, but that's because the French and the Spaniards lost the first S, and so the word became, looks much different from the way it is now. Um, but by the, it, it might be helpful to remind you, we're not talking about ancient history here. By the time the Sumerians, are said to have inhabited the Crimean Peninsula, the Great Pyramid of Giza was already 2,200 years old. 
uh, longer than the whole Christian era. And the steppe pyramids at Saqqara, uh, also in Egypt, were then 4,000 years old. So uh, you might say that the Sumerians are relative newcomers to the Middle East. In the 7th century BC, we believe that the Sumerians were replaced by another Indo-European speaking people called the Scythians. They were the ones who produced the gold that I showed you in the first uh, clip. And the Scythians' trump card was apparently their equestrian archers, among whom the women apparently were as fearsome as the men, and who were apparently the original Amazons. And the Scythians' Mongol ponies and their skill at horsemanship made them a regional power for four centuries. And apparently, what they developed was the ability to control the horse with their knees and their feet, leaving their hands free to use as uh, for the bows and arrows. Now, four, four centuries actually might sound like a relatively short hold on the peninsula. But of course, in today's terms, you know, it's uh, four centuries takes us back a long way. And the Russians, of course, have only been in the Crimea now for just over 200 years. So in historical terms, it's the blink of an eye. Now, the Scythians traded profitably, and they intermarried with the Greeks, and their wealth was reflected in the superb jewelry, uh, which um, has been sort of excavated from their tombs. And if you go to... Um, the Crimea, or to Kiev, uh, which of course uh, used to be the capital of the state in which, of which Crimea was a part, you see fantastic exhibitions of Scythian jewelry. Uh, and uh, the workmanship is just exceptional. When you think how badly people represented horses, you know, right until the 18th century, you know, these are fantastic depictions. Now, at the same time, um, another people who settled on the southeast of the peninsula were the Taurians. Uh, they're on your sheet. Uh, and Herodotus tells us that they made their living by plundering and war. And of course, making a living by plundering and war suggests that you're living in a region of a reasonably dense population. Otherwise, there'd be nobody to plunder from or make war on. And uh, like the Scythians, they practiced human sacrifice, which inspired the famous tragedy Iphigenia in Tauris, one of whose dramatizations by Euripides, Mozart, Goethe, or Tiepolo you may have seen. And eventually the Taurians came into conflict with the Scythians, and they were forced to acknowledge their overlordship. <coughs> However, the Scythians could not sustain their dominance. In 339 BC, the Scythian king Attias was decisively defeated by Philip of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great. And perhaps we shouldn't judge Attias too harshly because he apparently he was 90 years old at the time of his defeat. And the whole of the Crimea eventually fell under the control of Greek colonies which were all fiercely independent of each other, as they were, of course, on the Greek mainland, um, unless threatened by non-Greek people. And the best known of these colonies is the one founded at four, in 420 BC at Chersonesus. I showed you another clip of that earlier. Uh, and Chersonesus apparently just means peninsula in Greek. Now, over the next 2,000 years, this settlement, the one we're looking at here, fell into total decay. Uh, of course, just like many of the great archaeological sites in Egypt. And it was only rediscovered in the 1780s when Empress Catherine the Great, of whom we'll hear more tomorrow, wanted to quarry the nearby shore for sand to build her new city of Sebastopol. And in the process of excavating the shore for sand, they discovered this ancient settlement. Then, in the first century BC, the Greek world fell under the control of Rome, and the Crimea became a province of the Roman Empire. 
and they chose to call it Torida, after the Torian inhabitants, who had actually disappeared by then, some centuries before. And then in the fourth century AD, the Roman Empire was divided into two, and the Crimea became part of the Eastern, Europe, Eastern Roman Empire, usually known today by its Greek name of Byzantium. So, if it's all getting a bit confusing, relax, that's the point of the lecture. Um, we've taken the story forward by a thousand years, in which, during which time the peninsula ex experienced at least six changes of masters. And as I say, if it's all becoming a bit of a blur, uh, as has been truly said, history is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> and in the third century AD, a new wave of invaders. But of course, if it went for all these wave after waves, I mean, the Crimea wouldn't be the fascinating place that it is. A new wave of invaders swept into the Crimea, and unlike all the previous people who had come from the south and from the east, these people, the Goths, came from the north and the west, probably from the southern shores of the Baltic Sea and southern Scandinavia. And the name Goths is very loosely applied, not just to one tribe, but to most of the Germanic people who migrated into the Roman Empire. And the Goths split into two groups. You may all know this from other sources. One went west and eventually penetrated as far as southern Spain. They're what we call the Visigoths, which just means Western Goths. And the best known subgroup of the Visigoths were the Vandals. And on their way to Spain, they sacked Rome, which is why they have been saddled with such a fearsome reputation for destructiveness. History, as everyone says, is all about who writes it. Winston Churchill was well aware of that when he said, history will be kind to me because I intend to write it. <laughs> and when the Arabs conquered Spain in the seventh century, they called their new territory the land of the Vandals, Al-Vandalus, now Andalusia. And the other group of Goths branched east, and we call them the Ostrogoths, Eastern Goths. And in the late third century, they captured the Crimean city of Simferopol, and 50 years later, they built a new capital called Mangup. And they, too, left traces of some remarkable workmanship. And all of these are beautifully preserved in the State Museum in Kiev. Now, the Goths were the first Germanic people to be converted to Christianity, Orthodox Christianity rather than Roman Catholic Christianity. And Greek uh, became their language of common use, and uh, a Gothic state collaborated with the Byzantine Empire, which, of course, was only overthrown in 1450, and so, in some ways, you could say that the Ostrogothic state in the Crimea was the last surviving province of the Roman Empire. However, we've gone too far ahead. Let's go back a mere 10 centuries to 500 AD. 500 AD was a fluid time in the Black Sea region. No great power had yet asserted itself in the area. The next contenders were the Khazars, who were a semi-nomadic Turkic people from Mongolia. Now, don't confuse Turkic with Turkish. Turkic really applies to the languages spoken by all the people west of China proper, one of whom are the Turkish people. Now, the Khazars established their authority in the southwest of the Crimea, which is the bit you really want to be in. Uh, and they were the first people to be both a coastal and an inland power. And the Khazars, interestingly, are described as being strikingly handsome, with reddish hair, white skin, and blue eyes. Something else which has attracted the attention of Western scholars 
is that the Khazars were probably, and I'm sorry to have to use that word again, converted to Judaism in about 800 AD, and they may have remained faithful to Judaism for about two centuries before deciding that it was in their best interests to convert to Islam. However, they were not the only Jewish community in the Crimea. In about the 10th century, uh, people called the Karaites settled in the Crimea, and they were another Turkic people who had been converted to a brand of Judaism which rejects the Talmud. And their language was similar to most of their neighbors, but they used a Hebrew script rather than Arabic. And like the Goths, the Karaites returned to play a strange role in our story 1,500 years later. Another group which was beginning to make its presence felt was the Rus, a mixture of Slav and Scandinavian people. In other words, Vikings. And as you would expect, their expansion followed river routes, and the areas which, over which they ruled became known as the land of the Rus, Russia, Russia. And here are the trade routes by which they migrated from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Um, and their state splintered into so many smaller units that a thousand years later, the last of their emperors still styled himself the Tsar of all the Russias. That was the official title of Nicholas II. And in 988, Prince Vladimir of Kiev, Vladimir just means Lord of the World, Prince Vladimir of Kiev decided that his people needed a religion, which until then they had not had. He rejected Judaism because he was put off by the prospect of circumcision. He rejected Islam because of its ban on alcohol, and eventually settled on Greek Orthodox Christianity. And the Greek outpost at Chersonesus, which we saw earlier, was its nearest stronghold. So that was where Prince Vladimir was both baptized and married to a Greek princess. And that scene has been mythologized many times. It's a seminal moment in the history of Russia. However, outside the Crimea, political turbulence was beginning to change the landscape. To escape the Seljuk Turks, there was a large Armenian migration into the Crimea. And they built the oldest Christian church in the Crimean Peninsula, which still stands and which still serves a small but significant Armenian community in the Crimea today. But the main cause of political turbulence was the emergence of an explosive new force, the Mongol horde under Genghis Khan. And they were undoubtedly the most successful warrior nation of all time. Like the Scythians 2,000 years earlier, and it's interesting how, how long we've uh, progressed in terms of time, their strength was based on mounted archers, but in far greater numbers and backed up by a superb military and civil organization. And it took Genghis Khan a mere 20 years to bring under control the 7,500 kilometers between Mongolia and the Crimea. And uh, here, approximately, is the sort of extent of the Mongol Empire. And Genghis Khan was capable of legendary brutality. And there are blood-curdling stories of pyramids of human heads and victims being executed by pouring molten silver into their ears or eyes. But on the whole, the Mongol hordes left local communities alone as long as they paid heavy tribute and most of the communities in the Crimea carried on with their lives much as they had before. In fact, the Mongols actively encouraged any trading links which would provide taxable revenue, which is how Italy's two great maritime republics, 
Genoa and Venice gained a foothold on the peninsula. And the bait which lured the Genoese and the Venetians to Crimea was the Silk Road. And uh, those uh, Genoese and Venetians included travelers like Marco Polo, who actually spent two years in Crimea on his way to China. Although it's only fair to tell you that some historians doubt that he ever got as far as China and suspect that his whole account is a fiction rather than fact. However, let's take him at his word for the moment. And with Mongol support, the Genoese came to dominate trade in Crimea, which they protected with fortresses like this one in Sudak, which still stands uh, in Crimea. And it has even been suggested that the Genoese brought the Black Death to Europe when a besieging Mongol army threw some infected corpses over the ramparts of this Genoese fort. And that's not impossible. And the Mongol uh, dominance encouraged the migration of other Turkic Mongol people from Central Asia who were eventually converted to Islam who came to be and are still known as Tartars. That's without a, a first R, T-A-T-A-L-R-S. And they gradually became the most numerous population group in the Crimea. And when Genghis Khan died in 1227, his empire was divided among his sons, and they quarreled amongst each other, and the empire fragmented. And eventually, local princes took control of its separate parts, all of them validating their claim by claiming descent from Genghis Khan. Now, apparently, that applies to one in every 200 males on the planet. So it's not too exclusive a claim. Now, one of these princes was Hachi Jirai, who saw which way the wind was blowing, and he allied himself with the most powerful group in the region, the Ottoman Turks. More people, I can hear you groaning. Well, the Ottomans were the most successful of the Turkic Mongolian people who'd been driven westward by the pressure of Genghis Khan. And the first great sultan of these people was called Osman, so the Europeans called his followers the Ottomans. That's how that name comes to be. And they took root in Anatolia, which is still their power base today. And here is the, uh, um, sort of broad, the, the broadest extent of the Turkish Empire. But Anatolia is the sort of main heartland of Turkey. Um, and as the Mongol wave receded, the Ottomans filled all the vacant spaces in Southwest Asia. And they conquered all the shores of the Black Sea, which for centuries was described as the Virgin Lake of the Ottoman Sultanate. Um, now, for the next 350 years, again, what sounds like a long time, except unless you're going back to the pyramids, the Crimean Tatars accepted the sovereignty of the Ottoman Turks, although relations were often strained, and the Crimean Tatars often pursued policies of their own. And they were strong enough independently to launch successful attacks on Moscow in 1521 and 1571. They maintained independent embassies at several European courts. And as time, but, but as time went by, they became more subservient to the Ottoman sultans, and the later Khans were often chosen by the sultan, the Ottoman sultan, contrary to the usual rules of Tartar succession. So, just to pause for a moment, the Crimean Tatars were the last of a uniquely diverse cast of characters who made Crimea their home before the Russian conquest in the 18th century. And so far, we've had the Sumerians, the Scythians, the Taurians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Ostrogoths, the Khazars, the Karaites, the Rus, the Armenians, the Mongols, the Genoese, and the Tatars. It's no wonder that it's a curious place. But of course, very few of those influences are still strong on the Crimea today, not directly. 
Now, the Crimean, the Crimean Khans, the Tartars, in other words, um, they had no uh, shame in talking up their position. They called themselves uh, the sovereign of two continents and the Khan of Khan of two seas. And it was they who built the palace at Bakhisarai, uh, of which we had a glimpse earlier. And here's another painting by an Italian traveler in the 18th century. And I called it an Arabian Nights fantasy, but actually it's a smaller version of the Topkapi Palace in what used to be Constantinople and is now Istanbul. And you might think that that's the pinnacle of Islamic architecture, but it was actually built by a Venetian architect called Aloisio. And fascinatingly, when he'd finished at Bakhisarai, he moved on to Moscow where he was responsible for the pinnacle of old Russian architecture. And this is the cathedral of the Archangel Michael in Moscow, where all Russian czars were buried until the capital was moved to St. Petersburg. In fact, almost all those exotically extravagantly Russian churches in Moscow were built by Italian architects. People used to, except St. Basil, incidentally, you know, the most famous, which was a Russian architect. But people used to think that all these Russian churches were the work of an amazingly prolific architect or family called Friazin, until it was realized that Friazin was the Italian, was the Russian word for an Italian. <laughs> now, the splendor of Bakhisarai speaks well of the cultural richness and the material wealth of the Crimean Khans. And this was obviously a society which had left its nomadic origins on the steppes a long way behind. And because the Crimean Tatars suffered such terrible hardships in the 20th century, which we'll come to in the next couple of days, it's been fashionable to champion the Tatar state as an, o as an oasis of civilization the heirs to millennia of oriental learning and refinement, which has been crushed by the insensitivity and brutality of their Russian conquerors. So let's have a look at how far that image corresponds with reality. Well, of course, Islam is a religion of the book. So we would expect the Khans to be highly literate and educated. In the 17th century, one of the Crimean Khans campaigned in Hungary and a Hungarian chronicler recorded that he was accompanied into every battle by a camel load of books. He wrote poetry, which is still read today, and was an accomplished musician, both of other composers and of his own work, which is still performed today. And by the time of the first Russian invasion of Crimea in 1736, the Khan's archives and libraries were famous throughout the world although that didn't deter the Christians from burning them down in the siege. And the, the cities of the Crimea, uh, Bakhisarai, Simferopol, had international reputations. Travelers reported that Simferopol was endowed with piped water, sewerage, and a theater where Molière was performed in French. The port of Eupatoria, or Yevpatoria, was said to be the equal of Rotterdam or Hamburg. And it's typical of the Crimea that the three buildings in Yepatoria, which survive from that era, are a mosque, a Karaite synagogue, and a Russian Orthodox cathedral. You know, this is really the sort of history of the Crimea. And so I don't want to labor the point about the diversity of the Crimea, but that is, of course, the point of the first lecture. And uh, Bakhisarai, the Tartar capital, was described as Europe's cleanest and greenest city. And curiously, the best known feature of Bakhisarai uh, is the Fountain of Tears. And the Fountain of Tears was commissioned by a veteran warlord in memory of a Polish slave girl in his harem with whom he had fallen in love. And the brief he gave to the sculptor was that, like him, the fountain should weep forever. But there are two interesting features about the fountain. 
One was that it was commissioned in 1764. In other words, only nine years before the end of the whole Asiatic period in the Crimea. And the other is that the reason that it's so famous is because the poet Pushkin, who was, who, who was himself, of course, the grandson of a black Ethiopian slave, um, he visited it, visited it in 1820 and was so moved that he wrote a famous poem about it, which even reads beautifully in translation. And there you can see a little bust of Pushkin next to the fountain. So there's no reason to doubt accounts of the cultural wealth of the Crimean incarnate. Now, what about its material wealth? Well, the Crimean Tatars encouraged trade in silks and salt and spices. But essentially, for three centuries, they operated a one-crop economy. And that one crop was slaves. And the wheels of the Ottoman world had always been oiled by slave labor. And the Crimean Tatars became its foremost traffickers. Slave, slave raids were a regular, almost annual occurrence in this area from 1420 to 1770. It was known as harvesting the steppes. And Sharia law forbade the enslavement of Muslims, but Christians were fair game. And the best source of slaves for Crimean raiders was therefore the lands to the north of the Crimean Peninsula, most of whose inhabitants were Slavs, who were often specially prized for their fair skins and tall stature. However, that much having been said, the Crimean Tatars were often not too fussy about checking whether any of their captives might not be Muslims, and this was often a source of friction between them and their Ottoman overlords. And the number of slaves involved is a matter of guesswork. But it's generally believed that altogether between three to four million slaves were deported between the 14th and 17th centuries. Uh, and at the height of the slave trade in the 17th century, it's been calculated that about 40,000 slaves a year were abducted from Russia. And just by way of comparison, of course, the Atlantic slave trade affected about 12 million people, so that's at least three times as many, while over a much longer period, Arabs captured about 15 million African slaves. Now, all of these estimates and all of the accounts of the treatment of slaves come from Christian sources, so we have to treat them with caution. But they do correspond with other information we have on the area. And apparently the Tatar's standard tactic would be to make a central attack on a settlement which sucked in its defences while they then went and raided the smaller places which had been left undefended. And captives would be herded back in small groups with hands tied behind their backs. The weak and the infirm often had their throats cut so that they would not delay the march. The famous traveller von Herberstein said that when they reached the slave depot, the elderly, who were not worth much money, were given to Tartar youths like rabbits to hunting dogs for their first military practice, and were either stoned to death or thrown into the sea or killed in some other way. But, of course, that is the Christian traveller von Herberstein. And the Duke de Gramont, who fought against them in 1664, wrote, the Tartars slit the throats of all men over 60 years old, who were thought incapable of work, 40-year-olds were saved for the galleys, young boys were kept for their pleasure, and girls and women were kept in order to continue the kind and later to be sold. Women apparently fetched twice as high a price as men. And in a tract written in 1615, another uh, Slav historian, Michael Litvin, says, the stronger slaves were castrated, others had their noses and ears slit, and were branded on the forehead or cheek. And by day they were tormented with forced labor and at night kept in dungeons. Well, this may or may not be representative and uh, wholly truthful. And of course, not all slaves lived lives of brutal misery. 
domestic service was often preferable to the back-breaking labor expected of a steppe peasant. And in one anecdote, dating to the last days of the Black Sea trade, a party of miserably impoverished Georgians who had been captured by slave traders were freed by the crew of a Russian naval vessel. Given the choice of a return home, marriage to Russian or Cossack men, or remaining with the Turkish slave master, the captives unanimously and without a moment's consideration exclaimed, to Constantinople to be sold. Well, that again may or may not be true. And uh, nor was slavery necessary a life sentence. Some slaves secured their freedom after a quarter of a century. One English traveler in Central Asia came across a party of 25 freed Russian slaves heading home from Samarkand, and captives who married did not pass on their slave status to their children, as was the case in the Atlantic trade. However, the overall impact of the slave trade was overwhelmingly negative. Even if we allow for some exaggeration, the verdict of a 19th century historian holds true. And he said, year after year, and this is an interesting point, year after year, thousands of people on the borderland vanished from their fatherland, while other tens of thousands set off for the southern border to protect the inhabitants of the central provinces from captivity and ruin. And if you consider how much time and spiritual and material strength was wasted in the monotonous, brutal, toilsome, and painful pursuit of these wily predators, one need not ask why people in Eastern Europe languished behind while those of Western Europe advanced in industry and commerce, in civil life, and in the arts and sciences. And this is a subject, of course, that has long uh, vexed Eastern European historians. Why did the West progress so much um, sort of more profitably than the east of Europe. And this Slav historian believes that the slave trade was responsible for that discrepancy. So the Crimean Khanate brings to an end what I think of as the Asiatic phase of Crimean history. And what I found fascinating about it was the massive diversity which went into its composition. However, I have to say, I do not shed any tears for the exotic splendor of pre-Romanov, pre-Russian Crimea. To me, it seems, in many ways, like a society ripe for the plucking. And tomorrow, we will see how it was plucked and with what consequences. Thank you. Russia on both of which he has previously lectured at summer school. He has also written a few books on South African and European historical, or history, not historical, history. Please welcome Chris Danziger. Okay, can everyone hear me? Thank you, Medi, for that introduction. She, she said, a modest introduction reminds me of the famous quip that Churchill made when Attlee was pointed out to him as a very modest man. Do you remember that? He said, he's got plenty to be modest about. <laughs> um, just... Welcome to the second week of summer school, and for those of you who have come for the first time this week, I hope you have as wonderful a time as I've heard the rest have had. It's today my great pleasure to introduce what I suppose I can call an old friend, Chris Danziger. Many of you will have heard him. Many of you will know that his lecture theatres are always packed. 
and that he is excellent. And after a break of about two years now, we've got three, we've got Chris Danziger back. He's given me a very modest CV and doesn't want to, want to add to it. So I'm going to tell you the little bit that we have. Um, Christopher Danziger was a student and a lecturer on UCT staff. He then went to England and for the last 17 years he's been a tutor in the Continuing Education Department of Oxford University. His special interests are the history of Napoleonic France and Roman of... That's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Well, uh, what I would have liked to have done is to take you totally by surprise with seven absolutely unrelated images. Um, and of course, uh, it won't take you quite by surprise because we're all here on a course about the Crimea, so you might guess the connection. But uh, here is a piece of golden jewelry um, made by a Scythian goldsmith in approximately 700 BC. And like a lot of the other things we're going to talk about today, and that goes right up to 2017, incidentally, um, we, are, uh, we don't know that much about the Scythians, but anthropologists describe them as a sub-Iranian-speaking people. And here are the remains of a Greek settlement uh, at Kherson. Um, whether... Can we close the door around? Thank you very much. About uh, whether I will be producing the little booklet of notes that I usually produce, and the answer to that is yes. And the reason that people ask me, I gather, is because then it means they don't have to bother to take notes while I'm speaking, which is good. Um, and uh, they'll certainly be here on Wednesday, those little notebooks, um, could even be before then. Okay, well, um, I'm going to... Uh, Hang on, why am I? I think I'm going the wrong way now. <laughs> I need to get to the beginning. Just a few uh, sort of housekeeping notices. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very fond of the UCT summer school audiences except there's a slight tendency not to be parted from your mobile phones. So if everyone could please switch them off now, I'd be very grateful. You should all have a handout, which they processed with amazing speed and efficiency when I came in this morning. And this handout is a chronology on one side uh, of the period that we're covering. And on the other side, there are some names and places uh, which you may find difficult to pick up when I mention them in the course of the lecture. So they're really just helpful references. Uh, I've already been asked a couple of times about 